Hey, good morning, everybody. We'll get started in just a moment. Hey, I got 11 o'clock. Good to see everybody this morning. Hope you're uh, safe and uh, warm wherever you are. Thank you so much for tuning in to service this morning and welcome to our service this morning, my house to yours. And uh, we're excited about you joining us today as we come together. Thanks for joining us as we worship God. Let's pray together as we get started. Father, thanks for the blessings that you have given to us this past week. Thank you, Father, for watching over and protecting us throughout the week. Father, we just pray that you'll touch us as we look at your word today and we think about some prayer requests. And, and Father, we just thank you for who you are and whose we are, and you sure have been good to us. So continue to help us as we search for joy on the journey, the joy that comes from you and the joy that is dependable, never lets us down. Thank you, Father, for who you are. Now bless us as we come together, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Isaiah 41.10 says this as we join this morning, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. God does, does says this many times in Scripture. Do not be afraid. We don't know what's going to happen this afternoon or tomorrow, but we do know whose hands it's in, and we know who's been there. So just take and, and uh, be prayerful as we get through this service. Be prayerful as we come together, and may God con continue to tremendously bless us. As far as announcements are concerned, just got one. Um, Tony Ratley sent this to me this morning. He's a Sunday school director. We have a teaching vacancy in the woman's Sunday school class. If anyone is interested in teaching this class to include the current class members, please see Tony Ratley for further information or questions you may have about the position. Remember, 1 Corinthians 1, 27-29, God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies those whom he calls. And so pray about that. Think about that. God, God's going to touch somebody. God's going to lay it on somebody's heart and uh, lead them to teach this lady Sunday school class. And so I hope and pray that you'll take and be much in, be much in prayer about, about that. Let's pray. Let, we're going to pray in just a few moments. But let's, let's remember one request that we got in this morning from Beverly Matthews. She said that Billy went into cardiac arrest this morning. They had to shock him back. They had to put a tube in, but the tube's out now. He's in ICU. So let's continue to uh, keep him in our prayers and her as they go through this. We have other people who are sick in the community, other people who are sick in the church, other people who are dealing with a lot of different things going on in their life. And so we want you to take and to be much in prayer uh, for each of them as you do that. Let's remember our deacons. Got 10 deacons. They do a great job. And uh, just hope and pray that you will... Uh, Lift them up daily in your prayers as the church is in transition. The church is between pastors. Uh, the deacons are doing a great job uh, in leading you all and praying for you all. The deacon family ministry program they've got going on, it's just they're doing a great job. Uh, Lance is the chairman of the deacons, and so remember him as that body gets together and they, as they continue to lead you. But also remember our pastor search committee. Pastor Search Committee is led by Beth, and uh, they are, they are even though they haven't said a whole lot lately, they've been giving you some updates. They are and spending a lot of time in prayer right now as they are getting, as they are continuing in this process. And the five of them are doing a great job. Hold them up. It is a, it is a critical job for the church right now. For this committee, your job at church is to pray for them. Their job is to stay in prayer 
and then go through the process of what God leads them through. God has a man out there for you, church. God already knows who that man is. The pulpit committee will help you to figure all that out as you all continue to pray. So please continue uh, to lift, to lift them, to lift them up. Other things going on in the church, we just want to take and lift all of them up uh, to whoever's being touched, whoever's sick, whoever's got other things going on in their life. We just want to take and lift all of them up and something that we want to be prayer warriors about and do that every single day. Um, you ought to have a time to set aside to pray. Now, you ought to be praying. I call them prayer sentences. You know, somebody calls and says, hey, so-and-so's in the hospital. Prayer sentence. God, please touch them, be with them, be with the family. Amen. And then when you get more time later on, you spend more time doing that. But it ought to be time that you get real specific with God and share with him what's on your heart. But also listen to what he has to say to you. And uh, during this transition time for the church, here we are in, in uh, third Sunday in 2022, uh, 16th day of January. And, and, uh, God is just going to bless you guys in this year. God is just going to bless all of you who are tuned in and listening and just take and depend upon him and call upon his name and he'll be right there with you. So let's just take a moment, have a moment of silent prayer. Some of you got uh, prayer requests that, uh, that we don't know about, but God does. And we just ask you to lift them up to him and we just pray that you'll just take and do that. So let's, let's lift all that up to him and let's take a moment to do that. And then I'll lead us in prayer as we get ready to, to look at our scripture this morning. So join me as we just take a few moments uh, of silent prayer. Indeed, Father, hear our prayer prayer that we want to lift up to you today with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, may your will be done in all that we say and all that we do. Father, we lift the deacons up to you. Thank you for the great job they're doing during this transition time. Continue to encourage them, continue to strengthen them, continue to touch them, Father, as the church rallies around them and prays for them. Continue to be at the pastor search committee, Father, as they are seeking your will and, and uh, doing what it you would have them to do as they go through this process of of looking at resumes and 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 praying and and seeing who you want them to present to the church somewhere down somewhere down the line and father we just lift them up to you we pray especially for beverly matthews today uh, as billy hart stopped early this morning they had to shock him back he's in icu they tubed him for a while that's taken out and but father um, during this difficult time, we just pray that you'll touch them, strengthen them, and may they feel your presence in what they're doing and the doctors and the nurses and all the hospital staff that are, that are working there with them. Father, we have other people in the hospital. We have people dealing with COVID. We have people, Father, that are dealing with other things going on in their lives and decisions that need to be made and where to go and what to do. And, and uh, Father, we just lift all of these up and pray that your will be done that your will be done in our lives each and every day. Touch Faymont Baptist Church as they're in this transition period. Father, touch those who are not part of that church but dialed in this morning. And we just pray, Father, that as we look at this word and we think about uh, the joy that we started looking at a couple weeks ago, that you will just remind us that true joy is found in a, re in a relationship excuse me, with your son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you touch and bless and be with us now as we open the word and as we look at it, continue to watch over people. May they continue to be safe. Help us, Father, to take and look out about our neighbors and see how they're doing. And Father, we just thank you for all you continue to do. So we put all this in your hand, Father. We pray your will be done. Touch all the churches that are not meeting today, but doing Facebook live services, some earlier, some as we're speaking right now, others will do it later. And Father, we just pray that your word and your will goes out to people who needs to hear that you are the hope of this world. Have been, are, and always will be. 
And Father, we just need to depend upon you for your strength and guidance. So touch us, bless us now, for it's in your blessed, precious, and holy name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians, the second chapter. Philippians, the second chapter. And verse verses number one through four. If you remember, we have been looking at what we, a, a, ser, a ser, sermon series we started a couple weeks ago called Find Joy in the Journey. And you remember the very first sermon that we looked at was, are we a church that is wanted in the community? If we were to close up, would the community mourn? Would they even know we were gone? So we looked at that and we saw how that God gives us joy with all that. And then last week we looked at being ready to live and being ready to die. And we can't be ready to die until we're ready to live. And we can't be ready to live until we're ready to die. And all that happens in and of us accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And he is what allows us to live life full of joy. Not happiness, but joy. No matter what's coming our way. And we can be ready to die. Paul talks about this. It's hard for me to make a decision, he said. I want to go, but I know I've got things here that I need to do. I'm just going to put it in God's hands. And that's really all that we can do is put it in God's hands. Today, we're going to take, and we're going to look at having a life full of joy. And Paul, in these first four, chapter, first four verses of chapter number two, says these words. And follow along if you have your scripture, listen along. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one's purpose, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for their own interest, but also for the interest of others. Father, touch us as we look at this word. Open our eyes and our ears. And Father, may you speak to us and may we listen to the message that you have for us this morning. Thank you for all those who are out there, Father. And we just pray that you'll bless him by the words that you're going to speak to us today. Through your Holy Spirit, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Walt Disney World. You talk to people about Walt Disney World, and, big, and for most people, I'm sure there's a small percentage that didn't have a good visit, but most people, when you talk about Walt Disney World, they get a smile on their face. Well, this year is their 50th anniversary. 50 years. Now, Walt, uh, now Disneyland out in California um, was operated much, or opened up much sooner than that. I remember going when I was a child, 9, 10, 11 years old, living in California. My dad was stationed there. We used to go to Disneyland every every summer. And uh, what a fabulous place it is. I've got fond memories of going to that place. I had a lot of happiness going to that place. But when you think about it, why is Disney so special? Because every single thing they do, they work hard to accomplish every single brick that is laid, every single costume, everything they do, every ride, every attraction, every experience is pointing towards doing one thing. And that is giving children happiness. That's giving people joy. And many of you who are listening have been to Walt Disney World. Some of, I know some people who are down there right now, others who have been there recently, and they talk fondly about what that means. But then think about it. The few days get over with, the week gets over with, we go back home and right back to the routine of work, routine of kids, back to the routine of taking care of the home, back to the routine of all those kinds of things. And sometimes people say they have a joy, when it compared to Walt Disney World, they have a joyless existence. But listen to me this morning. God never intended for life to be a Disney experience all the time. Oh, it's great to go there and it's great to experience what, the, what goes on there and have great memories and take a lot of pictures, but God never intended for our life 
to take and to be one day up with up and the next day down when it comes to joy. Now there is days that we're up and days that we're down, but God is saying to us, as Paul is writing, that we can experience joy every single day. No matter what the circumstance is, no matter what we're going through, whether we're adult Walt Disney World, dealing with sickness, dealing with whatever that it is, troubles, heartaches, headaches, pain, suffering, God created this universe so that we could experience and have his complete and consistent joy in our life. That's why Jesus said these words in John 15, 11. I have told you these things. Why? So that my joy may be in you and my joy may be complete. And that's why we started two weeks ago this series of looking at a journey that in finding joy. God wants our life. When we accept Christ and he is our Savior and our Lord, God wants our life to be one that is full of joy no matter what has happened. Now, you've not heard me in the last two weeks, and you won't hear me today say much about happiness. You see, happiness is on circumstances. So some days we're happy and some days we're not. But joy that is cons that is consistent and joy that is centered on Jesus Christ is a joy that we can experience every single day. And let me tell you, we only go through this life one time. Someone once said that we take the ride of life only one time. And that as we take that joy or that ride of life one time, we should experience joy. Yeah, there's bumps in the road. Yep, there's sharp curves. Yep, there's steep cliffs. Yep, all that goes on deep valleys. And our, but our desire should be, as God's desire is for us, that we have joy that is found in Him. So here's the question we need to ask. Do we maximize our pleasure and minimize our pain as it is centered and found in Jesus Christ? Do we face every day with a spiritual smile on our heart, a bounce in our spiritual life, joy in our spiritual heart, regardless of what the circumstances are. In Philippians 2, Paul gives us three a three-step formula that we can have joy for the ride. We can have joy no matter what it is that we are going through. And it, look what he says in verse number two. Make my joy complete by thinking the same way as who? Jesus Christ. And so we want to enjoy the ride of life. Paul says there's three things we need to do. It will not guarantee that you'll always be happy, but it will guarantee that you can experience the joy and be joyful in what God would have. So the first thing we see is this. It's found in verses 1 and 2. Paul is saying to the church there in Philippi, he says, listen, if we want to have joy, joy that is every single day, Jesus has to be preeminent in our life. Look at what Philippians 1 verses 1 and 2 says. If then... There is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now notice, this is not a conditional statement. This is not a possibility. This is a probability. When we are united in Jesus Christ, when we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit that resides inside of us, when we accept Jesus Christ, when we have a common love for Jesus Christ, we can be people of joy. And Paul, when he talks here, is starting with an assumption. He is assuming, as he writes to the church, that the church's focal point of their life is Jesus Christ. He's assuming that their lives completely evolve around Jesus Christ. He assumes that Jesus Christ is first in our life and in their lives. He assumes that nothing or no one is more important to us than Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus came, the fact that Jesus died, 
The fact that Jesus lives in us when we accept him as our Savior and Lord. To be with him throughout all eternity, that ought to bring us joy as we think about that and we seek to do his will. And beyond that, it is not just that we have Jesus Christ in us that we can have joy, but we have comfort in his love. Comfort in how that he walks with us and he talks with us and he goes with us no matter what that we face. What fills us with joy is that Jesus loves us. Now, sometimes people are indifferent to that. At times, we do get indifferent about things. You see, we got to be reminded on, a, on occasionally that Jesus created us, that Jesus holds the power of death and life in his hand. It is Jesus that will determine where we spend eternity by what we do with him and the decision we make about him as our Savior and Lord, or we reject him in this life. This Jesus Christ, who we ought to give preeminence to, to have joy, loves us beyond all measure, always has, and always will. And that's why we are able to love him, because he first loved us. He cared about us. Think about this. Paul is saying that if Jesus loves us, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, then we can love Jesus and we can love other people. And the reason why this is so important is, think about it. Why do we exist as a church? Think about it. Why does Faymont, or if you're listening, what church you go to, why does your church exist? What is the mission of your church? What is our purpose? Well, someone basically said this way, to point people to Jesus Christ and to inspire them to a life that is cross that is a cross-shaped life, which means we always are pointing other people to Jesus and those who know Jesus, we are working to disciple them so that they understand and can feel this joy that Jesus has. If we're not doing this, then the church ought to be out of business. If we are not reaching people and discipling one another and loving one another, then we ought to be out of business. So here's my question. What's the biggest thing? What's the number one thing that the church can do to pull this off? Well, the Bible tells us to love Jesus first. He's preeminent and because of his love for us and our love for him to love other people. Listen to what Jesus said in John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. What does that mean? How are they going to know that it's our job to point people to Jesus and to help them to be discipled? Jesus said, if we love one another, when people outside your church comes inside your church, they should know that you love each other. They should know that you care about each other. They should know that you're just not hanging out because you don't have anything else to do. They should know that you are not just there to fill a pew and to sit there and not do anything. They ought to say, these people really do love one another. And that's the difference that they ought to see. Making Jesus joyful, making Jesus preeminent in our lives so that we can love him and reach out to love other people. We give Jesus preeminence and we keep him there no matter what's going on in our life. And that joy fills us up. You see, it is the Holy Spirit's job to keep us focused on Jesus Christ. Paul says that we should want to be focused on Jesus. We should stay in love with Jesus. We should point people to Jesus, who is the hope of the world. And we need to keep in mind and heart that Jesus Christ is always with us. He sees what we do. He sees where we go. He sees what we speak. He knows the intent of our heart and what it is that is moving us and driving us to do what it is he'd have us to do. And so the Holy Spirit helps us. Now, listen to this. There is a difference in being indwelled by the Holy Spirit and being influenced by the Holy Spirit. If we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he is the master of our life, we have accepted him, then the Holy Spirit indwells inside of us. But not everybody is equally influenced by the Holy Spirit. The truth is what Paul is saying is when we get out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, when we get out of fellowship 
with the Holy Spirit, we get out of fellowship with each other. We cannot pit the Holy Spirit versus the Holy Spirit. We can't divide the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying as long as we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, we can get along. People who come from different walks and different backgrounds can be a strong and formidable church full of joy, even though they don't see eye to eye, because they are in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. They are not only indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but they are influenced in their decisions and how they treat others by the Holy Spirit. We may disagree, yes. We may debate at times, yes. We may discuss at times, but we will never divide over anything that is a biblical principle and is the basics of who we are when we are in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and in fellowship with one another. Make my joy complete, Paul says, by being like-minded. Now, being like-minded does not mean that we think the same 100% of the time. What it does mean is that we are always thinking about biblical things. We're always thinking about the same things. We may look different ways to get there, different ways to do what Christ would have us to do, but the joy is that we make Jesus preeminent in our life, and we look to walk the walk with him and to talk the talk, not just to say, well, do this or do that, and then we go off and do what we want to do. That's what made Jesus angry at times with the Pharisees and others. You need to act this way, but don't act my way because I want to do it the way I want to do it. And that's what causes problems. And they, there's no fellowship with the Holy Spirit when we're taking and not doing what the Holy Spirit would have us to do. He may indwell us, but our question is, is the Holy Spirit influencing us to help us to be and to see Jesus as the preeminent person in our lives. By thinking this way, we all will agree that Jesus is number one, that we give Jesus preeminence in everything we are, everything we do, and we agree that we'll not always think the same, but we'll and we'll not always see things the same, but we will come together in oneness and unity and the Spirit to follow the leadership of Jesus Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong with having differences, disagreements, discussions, debates. But when we get, because when we give Jesus the preeminence of our life, nothing will divide us. We'll put our hands on the row, on, a, on an oar, and we'll row together. We'll put our arms together linked and we'll stand up as a mighty army through the leadership of Jesus Christ in our lives. And when we love one another, being one in spirit and one in mind, we will be full of joy because we are giving Jesus Christ preeminence in our life. Secondly, when we give Jesus preeminence, we give priority to others. How do you know that you've given Jesus preeminence? How do we know that when Jesus is first place in our life? You see, when Jesus is first, then we will be third and others will be second. Now, brothers and sisters, that does not come naturally. We are not wired by the world that way. It comes supernaturally. So Paul goes on to say in verse number three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. See, selfish ambition is when we want to put other people down. Vain conceit is when we want to build ourselves up, no matter what we say, no matter what we do, and no matter how we hurt other people. Selfish ambition is when we, we want to win and everybody else loses. Vain conceit is when we want to win no matter what happens, and we could care about other people. We just want to be number one, and we don't want anybody else to do that, and we don't care if they lose or how they do it. You see, the reason it's so hard to deal with this is because we are all born selfishly. We are all born with conceit. But listen to me, we are not the only person on this planet. There's billions and billions of others around us. What are the favorite words of a child? Me. My, mine. We are all, we are all born with the desire 
for others to put us first and for us to be first. But Jesus says there's only one antidote to this. Listen to what he says in verse number three. Rather in humility, value others above yourself. You see, this is countercultural. The world doesn't think this way. Everything we hear and we read in the world says, look out for number one. Take care of number one. Satisfy number one. But what does God say? God says, no, the way to have joy, the way to follow the preeminence of Jesus Christ is to look out for others also. The world tells us to do everything we can to get ahead. God says, nope, do everything we can to be a servant to other people. To be other, And that's what brings joy. Instead of stepping on others, we should take and help them up. Put them on our shoulders. Help them to get to the top if that's what God is calling them to do. The way to have joy is to think of others the way that we want them to think of us and to think of them in a spiritual way where the preeminence of Jesus is first. How do we do that? We value others more than we value ourselves. Now, that is tough. That's not something we want to do. You see, value refers to a conclusion that says through the leadership of Jesus, he will be number one, they will be number two, and I will be number three. It doesn't mean that we, when we're around people, we act like they're important. And then when we're not with them, we stab them in the back. We're not with them, boy, we talk about them. We're not with them, boy, we talk them down because we want to make sure that they are not as good as we are in the eyes of other people. But listen to what Paul said in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number three. For by grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, let's get a little uncomfortable for just a moment. Just a moment. How many times have we thought more highly of ourselves than we should have? How many times have we said something bad about somebody so that we look good? How many times have we passed on things that we didn't know if it's true or not because we knew it would help us to look good? Boy, he's in the know. She really knows things. See, we all tend to be more highly, think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. But, peace, but what does he say? We need to be humble. And when we are humble in God, then we can think about Christ as preeminent. We can think about other people. And that is where joy really comes from. We see people as Jesus sees them. We look through the eyes of Christ. We hear them through the ears of Christ. We do for them things that Christ would call us and have us to do through the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And so if we want to have joy, if we want to take and have a life that is full of joy, Jesus has got to be preeminent. And then we have got to give others priority. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. And what Jesus is calling us to do. So we want to be joyful. Then thirdly, not only do we have the preeminence of God, not only do we give priority to others, but thirdly, when we do this, when Jesus is first and others are second, it gives us a purpose. Now notice this. We should realize that when we give Jesus first, we will be full of joy. Listen to what verse number four says. Everybody should look now, not only for his own interests. Now, that's what the world says. Stop right there. Don't go any further. But also for the interests of other people. Let me tell you how this works. Nobody lived a more joy-filled life of the billions of people who have lived upon this earth than Jesus Christ. And nobody gave more joy to other people than Jesus Christ. And the reason that his life was pure, undeniable joy, is that from the moment he came upon this earth to the moment that he left, he was always looking out for the interests of other people. There was no me, my, my. It was all about other people. It was all about taking care of other people. If we want to get where we want to go, if we want to get where Christ wants us to go, if we want to help others get to where God wants them to go, we need to look out for them. We need to take and say, it is time for us 
to stop being so selfish and to be selfless in, our, in how we live and how that we deal with others and how that we worship with people. You see, that's where true joy is found out. And then somebody says, well, wait a minute, preacher. Wait, 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 wait. If I'm looking out for everybody else, who's looking out for me? Well, there you go, right there, right back to the old worldly thing. It's about all about me. Well, let me tell you what somebody said. When we look out for others, God looks out for us. Now, let's think about this. You're looking out for others, they're looking out for you. You're looking out for others, they're looking out for you. You're looking out for others, and they're looking out for you. And some of you are thinking, now, wait a minute, wait, wait, how can that be? Well, how it happens is through Jesus Christ the preeminent of Jesus Christ and the attitude that he puts inside of us through the Holy Spirit that we're going to begin to look for others and then that be, look out for others. And then that becomes our purpose and we get joy out of serving others. Now I know people and you know people that their greatest joy is how many people they can get to serve them and how that people wait on them and how that people take and, and do things for them. Well, there's a place and a time for others to do things, but we need to be primarily thinking about and consistently working on doing what Christ would have us to do, and that is thinking for other people. In the kingdom of God, there is a principle that goes against the world, and here's what that principle is. The lower we get, the higher we go. The lower we get, the higher we go. The secret to joy is not being able to climb to the top of the ladder. It is being willing to go to the lowest rung and help other people to climb up that ladder. Do you get happy when you hear good news about someone's life? Or do you get jealous? Do you ask the question, well, why didn't that happen to me? Doesn't God love me anymore? Doesn't God care about me anymore? I've worked harder than that person worked. I put more hours in than that person did. I don't understand how that's going on. You see, being willing to go to the lowest rung and help other people up the ladder, listen, there is no life so empty as a self centered life. And there is no life so centered and full of joy as a self-emptied life. So how does this work out in our life? Jesus is preeminent. We're working hard. We're praying. We're making him first. Through the Holy Spirit, we're thinking about others, thinking about how important it is that we help them to climb. Through the Holy Spirit and the preeminence of Jesus, now we've got a new purpose in our life. Jesus refocuses our purpose from what the world says we ought to do to what he says as we study his word and as we pray and as we answer and listen to his call upon our life. When we And so how does this work? Well, there's a couple of things. Worship, dis, or disi, discipline, or discipleship, and serving. When we worship, we give Jesus preeminence. And that preeminence is to be all through us and go out. When we worship, we, say, we should say, Jesus is the most important thing in my life, period. Now, our families are important. And the Bible tells us to take care of our families and to love our families and raise our families. But our families should never take the place of Jesus in our life. And when Jesus is number one, our families will be taken care of and we will do the things that God would have us to do. You know, we had a thing going on in the Baptist convention in the state. Who's your one? Who is your one? If you had to write down right now, who's your one? Who is that number one person that you are determined to, to share with them and to, to witness to them so that they can find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Who is that one that can do that? Who that, who's that one we're going to sacrifice and give up some time? Who's that one that we're going to sacrifice and, and spend some extra time in prayer 
so they can hear the gospel and possibly receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You see, we just gave ourselves a purpose. Bad person. And Jesus laid them upon our heart. There'll be other people that Jesus will lay on our heart. There'll be other things in our church that Jesus will lay upon our heart. There'll be other things in our community that Jesus will lay upon our heart when he's preeminent, when we're thinking about others. And he gives us a purpose to serve him and to serve him as we go through this life. We can have a joy, a life full of joy when Jesus is first, when others are second, and when we are third. You see, that's the joy ride. We put Jesus first. He's preeminent. Others have priority in our lives. And we give yourselves purpose. Now think about it for just a moment as we get ready to come to a close. What we've done is we've spelled out joy. J-O-Y. J, Jesus. O, others. Y, yourselves. You see, joy. J-O-Y. Jesus is prominent. Others are a priority. We have purpose in our lives, yourselves, to serve others and to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in what we do and say as a church. No matter if we're in transition waiting on the next pastor, we still have a mission. And the mission is to share Jesus and to help discipline or help disciple other people and to help each other grow and, and to help each other to become what God would have us to come. You see, that is the joy ride. That's how we can have a life full of joy. We put Jesus first and everything else falls into place. You see, Paul is telling us, you make Jesus preeminent, put others where they belong, and you have a purpose given to you by the Holy Spirit. Not what the world thinks, but what Jesus thinks. Given to you by Jesus Christ. And we, uh, and we, through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, get in God's word and get into where he'd have us to go and to do what he's called us to do. I shared with you at the first, and we're doing announcements. Faymont needs a teacher for the ladies class. God is calling somebody in Faymont right now to take over that class. I don't know if it'll be outside the class. I don't know if it'll be somebody from inside the class, but God is speaking. And so we need to ask ourselves, not only on that, but whatever else we do, is Jesus preeminent? Do we think about others more than we think about ourselves? Do we have a purpose that Jesus Christ gave us? When we have that purpose, that's the joy ride God designed it to be. And our life will be full of joy. That's how you experience joy in your life. J-O-Y. Easy to remember, an acronym, easy to remember. But boy, is it hard to do at times, isn't it? So I hope you'll join me today and every day. When we think about joy, make Jesus first. Others have a priority. And he gives us a purpose that is centered in him and not in the world. Amen? Father, thank you so much. Wow, what a tremendous passage of scripture this is as, G as Paul is talking to the church at Philippi and reminding them what joy is all about and how they can have that joy, even though they are being ridiculed and, and they're being hurt by their society of that day. Father, we got people who are being hurt and ridiculed by our society today. We have people, Father, who are wondering, are they at the last bit or can they hold on to, the, to that string any longer? Father, a world that tells us if we want hope and joy to do it this way, but all it does is it's, it only lasts for a short period of time and it leaves us joyless. So, Father, may we have joy every single day because you're first. Others are, the, are important. They have priority. And you've given us purpose. Yourselves. To you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Continue to protect people today through this storm. 
that's going through. Continue to be with all the different churches that are represented in our communities. May they seek, may they seek to follow you in all they do and say, no matter what the world says, and to stand strong. Father, if someone needs to make a decision, we pray they'll call their deacon, call their pastor, and talk to them about what God has laid upon their heart. And we thank you for a life that can be full of joy because of what your son did for us. Touch each person now, Father, for it's in your blessed and precious and holy name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Hey, listen, God bless you. Have a great day and a great week. Go in peace wherever you go. And may people see Jesus by what you do and what you say. And love your church as you love him. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.